me just do a couple bookkeeping things. Um, welcome to the this course on general relativity as a quantum field theory. You know, my what I'd like to convince you is that this is the most interesting quantum field theory in the world um, because you know, we know QED is QED is pretty simple. QCD was a lot of fun for a long time. And aside from calculational things, we understand QCD, but general relativity has it all. It has it has very subtle field theory aspects, has frontiers, it's good stuff. So what I'd like to do is try to recreate general relativity, not like the normal textbooks, but like we do in a quantum field theory course for QCD, for example. Because it is just one of our fundamental interactions. Secondary goal is, is I'm aiming this at a level that UMass students that have had quantum field theory one, it's, it's, that's the level that starts with. So there's a bunch of things that I have to do along the way to, that I want to use in gravity, but it's just as fun to do it in gauge theories or um, other theories in advance, so advanced quantum field theory methods. And so some of these things are listed here, you know, the background field methods, heat kernels, gauge fixings we don't, we've, we don't do in quantum field theory one, et cetera. So there's a whole set of goals sitting over on the right side that I want to do also. There's a website for the course where I'll post the notes that I, I do here. The website looks like that. There's also going to be some sources are put up there and some of the conventions as I go, I will keep the con write the conventions out. One of the features that's perhaps unfortunate is that there's no perfect book for this. And the, so I'm pulling it from a lot of different sources. Those sources are listed there. Um, that's this trust but verify note that I have there. Trust but verify is an old Russian proverb that that um, that was used by Ronald Reagan during the uh, test ban, um, and he was using, of course, to, that they have to verify the test ban treaties and all that. Um, for here, it means I'm not deliberately misleading you, but since I'm pulling it from a lot of different sources. A lot of different sources. I may have minus signs all over the place. I may have indices in the wrong place. So if you're going to use this professionally, don't take my notes without checking your minus signs. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Any questions up in Dartmouth? Still hear me? Okay. Good. So let's try. We're trying to do a theory of gravity. We have. We have the potential minus G M1, M2 over R, and G is 1 over M Planck squared, which is then 1.22 times 10 to the 19 GeV minus 2. Clearly, I'm going to use h bar is equal to c equals one units. I um, started right there. Um, you will sometimes see a reduced Planck mass. So this would be one over eight, there's an extra eight pi g Newton in it. This guy comes out to be roughly two times 10 to the 18. GeV. So, depending on whether you include that 8 pi or not, there's an order of magnitude difference what what you call M Planck. Okay. So, as a quantum field theorist, if you wanted to get this, well, you wouldn't use photons or spin one particles because spin one particles repel each other when they're the same type. 
so it's not attractive. So you might try using a scaler. In, in particular, the, the one that you might try, let's just do this and see what's wrong, is a Higgs. The Higgs coupling, Lagrangian for the Higgs coupling, is um, minus the mass, so it's coupled directly to the mass, two, square root of 2 V, you know, psi bar, psi Higgs. So that sounds like a good place. You do Higgs exchange, you would get minus I. Well, actually, let me just go straight to V. Yeah, well, all right, we can do it. Minus I M M I over square root of 2 V. Just to remind you of Feynman rules. Q squared minus M squared. And minus I M J over square root of 2 V. If you Fourier transform that and take the non-relativistic limit, you would get V of R is it's attractive minus 1 over 8 pi V squared. You get M I M J over, over R e to the minus M Higgs R. So you might try calling this G, and you'd say, let's take V to be the reduced Planck mass. There's the 8 pi. Reduced Planck mass that make V 10 to the 18th GeV. Take M Higgs to 0. And you've got yourself a theory of gravity. Okay. So, so let's take suggestions on why this fails. So let's, I'll let the Dartmouth guys go first, since I want to test whether they can actually ask something. So what's, what goes wrong with this? Okay, I can't use the face, but just answer. Are you still hearing me? What? Well, the exponential falling can be solved from M setting M to zero, so then it, it doesn't do that. Okay, well, you, you, you can, you, okay, so, so one, one suggestion is that uh, having a VEV with zero mass doesn't work. You could, you, you, you can dial it. You know, there's the fine-tuning problem. Okay, so you, you you have to you have to you have to work at it, to be fair. But but um, you could even just you know postulate this as a theory with with that as the coupling. Okay. Um, well. Okay, so let me, I'll, I'll start with one of the things wrong with it. Anybody else want to suggest something along before we, before I start doing my things? Okay, well, what? Um, the, the short distance, it works fine. It's, if, if mh is zero, it has the, the same distance properties as the gravitational interaction. All right. Well, here's a here's a couple things. Um, one is that the these masses here, you have to ask which are the masses that go into it. So if those are really the Higgs, the quark masses actually are a small part of the nucleon mass. Okay, and so just as a foreshadowing for when we do anomalies, I'm going to do, later on I'm going to do the trace anomaly. And one of the consequences of this 
is that the um, proton mass is you know, it's the proton's matrix element of the trace of the energy momentum tensor. And this has the form it's the beta function times the gluon field strength squared plus the mu u bar u bar u plus m d d bar d. It's an older mass to sit there, but let's just stop there. And if you do that, the quark masses give about 40 MeV to the nucleon mass. This guy's about 900 MeV. And that's from the gluons, which has, has no mass. So this guy wouldn't couple up to the scalar. Okay. A second thing. You still there, Dartmouth? Yep. Okay, good. I just didn't see more motion. A second thing um, is binding energies. Binding energies contribute to, to, to nucleon masses. So there's a, in nucleon, there's about 10 MeV per nucleon. That certainly wouldn't be included in this. If you were doing it today, you also know there's gravitational lensing, so photons wouldn't couple. So gluons don't couple, photons don't couple, binding energy doesn't count. In this type of case, momentum doesn't count. So if you, if you have delta E is, you know, 1 over 8 bar delta T for uncertainty reasons, or delta, you get energies 1 over uh, delta, the distances for binding states. When you have bound states, those type of energies don't contribute. So basically, Higgs theory doesn't work. But it does put this this exercise does point us into the direction where we need to go. So that's where I want to go next. Any questions on that before I move the slide off? All right. Yes. So the so I'm just going to repeat questions for the people in Dartmouth. The, the question was in, when you do scattering diagrams in say QED, you get potentials that are very similar to this, and that's true. So basically, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to mimic the, what you do. We normally do it with photon exchange, and you get the Coulomb potential out. And I was saying, well, let's make the Higgs massless, and you'll get out a Yukawa piece or a, a 1 over R potential. And it would look almost, it would look almost but not quite like a gravitational interaction. Okay? But this is the not quite part. It doesn't, it doesn't couple up to photons. It doesn't couple up to stuff. So the, what this Points to, it points to a couple of things. And the, the couple of things all go by in the name of the equivalence principle. So if we're, if we're doing the equivalence principle, so if that's the very easiest, you say F is M, the gravitational mass times the gravitational potential equals the inertial mass times the acceleration. So the equi equivalence of the gravitational potential and, and the acceleration. 
if we then start making a relativistic theory, E is equal to mc squared, or more generally, square root of p squared plus m inertial squared. This tells you that you really do. You can't just focus on the mass. You have to focus on the, on the energy. So lesson number one from the equivalence principle is that you have to focus on, on energy. And in a relativistic theory, that includes momentum. Okay. If I then say, well, I'll, I'll we'll try to do that for the, the scalar, there actually there's a lesson that, that's not completely obvious, but that there's no combination that can work for a scalar in all situations. Okay, so you might try something like phi f squared. Well, there's something that couples up to photons now. Yeah, but on-shell photons have f squared is e squared minus b, so proportionally e squared minus b squared, which goes to zero. So it really doesn't work either. Um, and you can just try it. You try it right out, out of Lagrangian, you'll find that there's no combination um, that works in all settings. Okay. Then conceptually, we can get out a couple lessons for this also. You know, here's these famous pictures, the Einstein elevators. You know, here's the here's a person dropping something in a in a gravitational field. G. And this is equivalent to taking somebody that's accelerating and having them drop the same thing. The equivalence of those two is part of the equivalence principle. And also free fall, if you're in a gravitational field, falling down, so here's the gravitational field, and, but you're accelerating down, there's no gravity, that's, that's equivalent to just sitting there in empty space with no acceleration, no gravity. So I don't know, those pictures make sense to you there, right? But if you were in free fall, the, uh, you're accelerating at the same speed as the, the object you're trying to drop, it doesn't drop, it just stays there, hangs there with you. And so these pictures conceptually drive us, and then also then tells you if you if you were doing the same thing with light, so let's say imagine I'm accelerating up and I shine in some light coming in from the outside, it's gonna look like it that's, a, that's supposed to be an arc. It's a curved trajectory because you're accelerating. It's going to make an, an arc inside the accelerating frame. It tells you that if you do the same thing in a gravitational field, <coughs> G, that you should bend light. So these these little thought experiments tell you two other things. They tell you the third conclusion out of this is that gravity is like a non-inertial frame. And it tells you that there there's, exists a coordinate system Which, which has no gravitational effects.
the free fall case. So if you're in using those coordinates, you're, you're, you, don't need, you don't see any of the effects of gravity. So actually, these guys all come into building it. So this one we've sort of disposed of. We're not going to do a scalar. But the focus on total energy and momentum is really how we're going to try to do it. And then we will build in these coordinate ideas as you go. So that's not just local? It's well, it's, it's, it's local, yes. Yes. OK. That's where it goes. OK. So trying to keep going here, let's do energy and momentum. E and P are associated with time and space translations. Sorry. Okay, so that's going to be where we're going to search for these things. And in fact, in a relativistic theory, we get an energy momentum tensor which describes this T mu nu. Now the Hamiltonian is, is the integral d3x of t0,0. Zero, zero. The momentum operator is the integral d three x of T zero I, so the spatial components. Its energy and momentum is conserved. So we have D mu T mu nu equals zero. There's four conservation laws. And since we're we are doing this based on symmetries, we should get this energy momentum tensor sorry, from Noether's theorem. Let me not do that because I do that in the field theory course, so I'm assuming that people have seen it. But the construction is that T mu nu from Noether's theorem is the variation of Lagrange with respect to d mu phi times d nu phi minus g mu nu times the Lagrangian itself. Okay. The example that I'll start with is just a scalar because it has, has no complications. We come back to these other things. Otherwise, if you take the Lagrangian, it's just one half d mu phi d mu phi minus m squared phi squared. Then t mu nu is d mu phi d nu phi. You can see that that first piece come from that minus one half g mu nu, d lambda phi, d lambda phi, minus m squared, phi squared. Okay. We've lost Dartmouth. Their internet is down. Oh well. I will catch them up somehow. Okay. And you can well. You can see the the conservation. Let's just do conservation while I'm at it. If I take d mu t mu nu, that turns into box phi d mu phi minus g mu nu. 
No, I'm sorry, that becomes just d nu. So there's a factor of two here. It's d lambda phi d. I'm missing a piece over here. Sorry, I'll be, I'll be back to it. d nu d lambda phi, a factor of two there, plus m squared phi d nu phi. And I missed a term over here. The first term, there's, there's also a d mu phi, d mu, d nu phi. Okay, this first piece is minus m squared. Cancels that last m squared there. These two pieces cancel. You get zero. Okay. The one thing I do want to do, though, that's... Okay. That well, let's let's actually, let's first do the punchline here, which is that it's reasonable oh, okay. okay, you're back, good scalar field. okay, so scalar field um I forget where you disappeared, but I, I'm talking about T mu nu and arguing that it's reasonable to make the energy momentum tensor the source and so basically if you if you do the same diagram that we did before but now we're going to exchange something which of course is gravitons if you have T mu nu up here T mu nu t down there, schematically we have some coupling, t mu nu, 1 over q squared if it's massless, t mu nu. These guys in the non-relativistic limit give the total mass, so, so you get then some coupling, m1, m2, over R out of this if you're using the, the total t energy momentum tensor. So it solves all our problems if we do that. Okay, that's then going to be our goal. And let me just do a note on normalization. I just, because I know this is confusing later on. Okay. We're going to normalize our states by choice of normalization of states is P, P prime is 2E delta 3 of P minus P prime. Okay. If you do those, that normalization, the normal decomposition of the field looks like the following. It looks like integral D. And I'm sorry, this is 2 pi cubed there also. The, the normal normalization of the states is dp over 2 pi cubed. There's a 1 over 2e that comes there, a of p, e to the minus i, p dot x plus a dagger of p e to the plus i p dot x. If we take the matrix, uh, the, no, I'm actually doing the whole Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian is the integral d3x of t0, 0. If you use that, you get out what you expect, which is, this becomes the integral d3p over 2 pi cubed times times the energy a dagger of p a of p plus zero point energy of course okay so that part looks normal yes 
so far, it doesn't have to be universal. The K. The I'm sorry. The the kappa. Yeah, the kappa. Yeah, so, far, so, the, so far, I haven't sh proven that it's universal. But clearly, if that's what you want, the equivalence principle is going to want you to tell you that it's it's the the T mu nu of the world with one coupling. And this is just the matrix element of the T mu nu of the whole world with, because otherwise you get into these troubles with the equivalence principle again. Okay. Okay, but here's where here's what sometimes is a little funny. If I take matrix elements of T mu nu, P to P prime, and I take that matrix element, what I would normally write out is just the following. So I'd write out, now you go up here. You've got d mu phi, d nu phi, minus this other combination. This would be p mu p prime nu plus p prime mu p nu. So those are the, that's the matrix element of the first guy. And then there'd be a minus g mu nu p dot p prime minus m squared. Okay. So that's what I'll, I would always write out. So it looks like it's, when I take the non-relativistic limit, it really looks like it goes to 2m squared because this, in the non-relativistic limit, the second piece disappears. First piece, the 0, 0 component is e. So e, there's 2e squared. Okay, so it almost looks like it doesn't work. But all this is because of this funny normalization here. What this matrix element really is, is really one of the um, square root of 2e. To e prime. Okay, but these guys we don't write. We just you know they're there, and occasionally you're going to want to take them into account. Like when I form this potential later on, I'm going to want to take them into account because my matrix element T mu nu is actually going to be this p primes. And so I have to take that into account to get that into the potential. Normally, this guy goes into, when we take matrix elements, we take D3P over 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2E times matrix element squared. It, it goes there, typically. We just pull it outside the matrix element and stick it there. Okay? but. When I when I say ah there's a factor of one over two e in this matrix element, this is where it comes from. Okay, any anybody questioning that? All right. So we now we've gotten far enough now that we want to make T mu nu the source. So, T mu nu is source. Okay. Well, how do we do that? So, here I have to remind you how we do this for other interactions. Let's go through gauge symmetries. Is we're going to want to make a, a gauge theory construction. Okay, so let's 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 do. I'm being pedagogic here. Reminder. Let's take a theory like a Dirac theory, I del slash minus m psi. This has a global invariance. psi goes to psi prime, which is e to the i, some theta psi, some, 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 some number up there, a phase symmetry. 
and that corresponds, uh, another tells us that there's a current. Says says the current is J mu is psi bar gamma mu psi. With it's that's also conserved, so that's good. And we can define charges, which are the integral of d three x of j zero. Which, if I quantize, ends up being things that look like, you know, d three p over two pi cubed. Well, for, I'm doing Fermion, so it's b dagger b minus d dagger d. That's a particle and antiparticle, so they have opposite signs of this charge for particles and antiparticles. So that I get this charge on a fermion is plus times the fermion, and charge on the antifermion is minus the fermion. So that's well and good. But if we then want to make this current the source. So we have this conserved quantity. To make it a source, you, you want to make a gauge series. So this, you now have some charges that are opposite for particles and antiparticles. Let's make a, a QED out of it. Because this is a, the pattern will follow for gravity too. So we'll take then psi to be a local invariance, e to the i theta of x psi. We're going to add a gauge field, a mu that has. So this is psi prime, a mu prime. The transform gauge field is a mu with a gauge transformation. It's in my normalization. It's going to be d mu theta, but I'll put a one over e there. And most importantly, I make this gauge covariant derivative. D mu is D mu plus I E A mu. And the purpose of this is to make the an invariance such that if I have D mu psi, that goes to some D mu prime psi prime which is okay it the goal is to make it so that it, it also goes like e to the i theta of x d mu psi Just a second I, I am. Can you hear me? No, we can hear you. We just can't see you, but... You can't see me. Your notes have also stopped. Yes, okay, let's... Yeah. Let's see if I can get my notes back. Is I, oh, there they go. They should be coming now. Um, possibly. Did you finish writing the psi on the RHF of the last equation? There, I just write, wrote something. Okay, good. I have no idea what that was, but okay. So let's just show the construction. So if I take d mu psi prime, I get d mu plus 
I E. Yeah, um, is, are you seeing me again? Uh, where, did you finish writing the, uh, I have not finished writing anymore, but I, my other computer has disappeared. Uh, okay, yeah, we'll here, no. okay. Here, uh, let, let me keep writing. If you can hear me, um, let's hope the notes come back on it. The, my computer says it's recon reconnecting, so. All right, so I'm just going to keep talking and hope the notes appear again. There they go. E. So this is a a prime is now going to be a plus one over e d mu theta acting on psi prime, which is e to the i theta of x on psi. And if I've got my minus signs right, um, which Um, yeah, I have a minus sign off. All right, let me forget my minus signs. Uh, they cancel. All right. Yes, and I should have a minus there is what I want. There we go. There's where my minus signs were. Um, so, anyhow, this this then leads to the invariance, and then the Lagrangian is psi bar I d slash minus m psi is invariant okay. and then you can construct the rest of the theory from this we've we've now got basically we've got a derivative covariant derivative that goes to that turns into d mu prime is um, e to the minus i theta, d mu e to the plus i theta. That's the equivalent to the, the line that I'm underlining. If I make um, d mu commuted with d nu, that gives me that gives me I E D mu A nu minus D nu A mu, which is I E F mu nu. That is then an invariant, and um, we can then form the Lagrangian is minus a quarter f mu nu f mu nu plus psi bar i d slash minus m psi this is the, the photon Lagrangian this is the Dirac Lagrangian and the the piece that sits here, this is the Dirac Lagrangian, the free Dirac Lagrangian minus E A mu J mu. So I do get the source. And so I end up getting the source. Okay? I think I, I think that sounds right. I think. Okay. So, the lesson here is is T mu nu is source. What you want is you want to gauge space time translation. So there's our logic. Pardon me. Yeah, rotations will be clear. You watch when I do it. I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna really do Lorentz transformations, but I, by the time I'm doing it, I'm doing it locally, so it's 
rotations and translations and gauging and it's all the same thing. Okay. However, if you'll let me let me do a detour just a minute. I just because I in the sense that we haven't as a class officially seen non abelian theories. I want to do the same trick I just did up above for non abelian theories just to do my notation. And because gravity and the non abelian theories look closer than they do to E and is than it does to E and M, mainly because in the non abelian theory the gluons couple up to the gluon themselves, so they have self couplings. Gravitons couple up to gravitons at gravitational fields. So it's the analogy is really with Yang Mills theory. So let me do Yang Mills because I, I'm going to end up doing this anyhow. Later on, I have to do quantization and all this stuff. So let's do Yang Mills. And it's just this is really just an SUN gauge theory. And I'm doing it mainly for the notation. Okay? Because this is this this then will look like gravity once we get there. So I'm gonna take a an n component psi, psi one psi two, all the way down to psi n, and just put them into a, a single representation. I'm going to look for invariance that like psi goes to u psi where this starts off as an n by n matrix and if it's unitary it preserves the normalizations of the field. Okay. An n by n matrix can be written as e to the i times the Hermitian matrix. This is Hermitian. And so u is the exponent e to the now there's a minus i, there can be an alpha zero, or there can be alpha a lambda a over, over two, where the lambda a's a are n by n Hermitian matrices, and I and I choose them to be traceless. The the trace full one is that, but this is just an overall U one, so I'm going to drop it. I just keep the 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 n squared minus one Hermitian traceless matrices there. Okay, these guys, if you choose a basis. Satisfy lambda a over two commuted with lambda b over two is some f a b c lambda c over two with and there's an i there and they satisfy trace lambda sorry on that one lambda a Lambda B is one half delta AB. Um, so, if we want to make this into a local a gauge symmetry. We take 
pi goes to psi prime is u of x, so some spatially varying psi. And we're going to look for a covariant derivative that goes to some d prime u of psi, which is also u of x d mu psi. If I do that, then I can make things like the psi bar i d slash minus m. Uh, psi prime, thank you. Okay, a nicer prime. There we go. Okay, so this would make that an invariant. And the the way to do it is d mu is partial mu plus i g. Take these lambdas over 2 and introduce this gauge field, a mu, which is much nicer to write in compact notation is I G A mu where I've absorbed the lambdas into there and so I'm going to put double bars under it for the moment and maybe later on I'll stop doing that but let's do it that's the matrix notation um, A mu with the double bars under it is lambda A A, a over 2 So then, you have a question? So if um, A mu goes to A mu prime, which is U A mu, U minus 1, and then the gauge transformation piece is I over G D mu U U minus one. Okay. Then we have D prime mu psi prime is D mu plus I G U a mu u minus 1 plus 1 over g d mu u u minus 1 acting on u psi. And you can see how it works. The, the derivative acting on u gives me a derivative acting on u, but then that gets canceled by the gauge term sitting right there. Um, the u then just the piece where u is not acted on by the derivative comes out to the front. This then is u of x d mu psi. Okay. So what I've I've shown then is is that d prime u is u d mu u dagger. or u minus 1, it's the same thing. And I've got my invariance. Then to complete this, I take the following. I take d mu d nu acting on psi. That's going to be defined as I G F mu nu, where that's this matrix notation acting on psi, which if I take off the matrix notation is I G lambda A F A mu nu over 2 acting on psi. 
And in matrix notation, this F mu nu is D mu A nu minus D nu A mu minus G, the commutator of A mu with A nu. So the commutator is the new piece, the interactions. And that's what we'll end up seeing also in gravity. And let me just then do this in non-compact notation. It's, uh, I won't, let's see, my index is A, D nu, A, A nu, mu, and it's minus G, actually, I'm sorry, this guy should have been plus I G with a commutator there. I, 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 that's, I'm pretty sure a mistake. This one here is the minus G F, F A B C, um, A B A C mu nu. Okay, and let's not waste a page. The Lagrangian is then minus a quarter F A mu nu, F A mu nu, plus psi bar I D slash minus M psi. Okay, so we've, we made an invariance and we get the, this invariant action coming from this commutator of the covariant derivatives. So clearly that's what we want to do then in in the gravity case also. So the, the preview where we're headed is I'm going to gauge, gauge basically Lorentz or Poincaré transformations. I'll explain what I mean by that. We'll have a new field. The new field here will be a metric field with two indices. There'll be a covariant derivative. And there'll be d mu. There'll be an invariant matter action. Okay, so like this piece here up in the gauge theory case, and that's going to have a nice feature that the, the variation with respect to this new field of the matter action is going to be, uh, let's just for the moment just put, it's going to be T mu nu of matter. So there's our source into the equations of motion. Then we're going to have to do D mu commuted with D nu to get uh, uh, the invariant action here, which I'll just call r mu nu dot 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 because I have to have to fill in all that in. And then this will give me the gravitational action, the variation with respect to this new field g mu nu of the gravitational will be some the Einstein tensor. We then end up with Einstein's equations g mu nu is some number times t mu nu, and we end up with gravity. Okay? So that's, that's the plan. Okay? Okay, so this procedure, I'm trying to make it look as much like Yang-Mills as, as, as I can. It 
it actually looks more like Yang Mills when I do fermions, which I'm postponing till later because it brings in some extra complications. Um, so with fermions, it looks really much more like a gauge theory. This one, you'll see there's some aspects that aren't exactly like it. Okay, so it's fun to watch that as we go. Okay, so the next step is to start looking at what I want to gauge. I have to do a little bit of Lorentz invariance review. Because basically what I'll end up do, be doing is gauging Lorentz transformations. So let's get our notation down for this. Okay. So here's the standard coordinate change. We take x. Four vector goes to x prime of the four vector, which is some matrix lambda mu nu x nu. At, at this stage, I, I mean, I'm going to do. I'm going to make Poincaré by adding a translation soon, um, and I'm only doing uh, fixed. Lorentz transformations now, I haven't made that a function of x yet. Okay, does that answer? Okay. And notation-wise, um, this is the first place where I'm, I'm potentially screwing up badly, but I'm going to try to keep this transformation with the second index shifted off to the right. So sometimes I'll put a little dot down there to, to, to just to make you notice that it's sitting off, the, the new is sitting off to the right, because in, it will actually make a difference. <coughs> yeah, I just, uh, I want to do that, okay? Okay, so if we want this to be an invariant, we want, um, so we're going to take the invariance um, x mu x mu, which is going to be eta mu nu x mu x nu. So we want things like the, the, the transform like four vectors to be invariant, so this eta in my notate in my basis, this is one of the places where you get screwed up is is the usual particle physics metric mostly negative and that most most general relativity texts are mostly positive. So watch out. The To make this an invariant, this then goes to lambda mu, well, I have to make it alpha, lambda nu, beta, so these guys have shifted over. Um, I have eta mu nu sitting there still, um, x alpha, x beta, so as I've transformed both of the x's. If that's an invariant, this has to equal eta alpha beta x alpha x beta. So that we have to then have this condition lambda mu dot nu lambda, um, now let's make it alpha mu beta um, on eta mu nu is eta alpha beta. Okay. If we use ones with the index lower, 
x mu is going to be then eta mu nu x nu. This this will then transform like basically I lower the indices. This this transforms is x prime mu is lambda mu nu. So now I've got the the second index shifted over x nu. So the dot just means that, again that there's a it shifted over. And that satisfies an invariance also that's just the, the equivalent of this one. But also to the point is we have, let's see, lambda mu nu or sigma lambda mu up here rho equals delta sigma rho. Okay. So the main point on this is that the This guy here is the inverse of that guy. So these, aside from these, the funny notation, um, as a treated as a matrix, it's this. The one is the transformation; the other is the inverse transformation. Okay. Um, So fields transform the same way. Fields fields transform as so phi of x goes to phi prime at x prime, which is phi of x. So that's a scalar field transformation. Phi prime at the transform coordinate is phi. This same number as phi of x, and a vector field a mu goes to a mu prime at x pri at the x prime is then lambda mu nu a nu at x. So it, its components transform, and also. Let's just for completeness, the partial derivative is defined as the derivative respect to x mu. And here's this, again, just pointing out the differences. d by dx mu upper is d lower. So this, this guy is d by dt and gradient. And this works such that d mu x mu equals 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 4. d mu x squared is d mu x alpha, eta alpha beta, x beta is then 2 mu, you get the 2 in the x mu, and if I have d mu with the upper is a to mu nu with the upper, or on the lower is then d by dt minus del on the upper. Okay, and we can include rotations here, the same notation. This is, in this case, lambda mu nu is one in the rotation matrices. And we can do translations. Um, X prime mu is lambda mu nu 
X nu plus some A mu. Okay. All right. So that's that's the that's the little review of the Lorentz invariant notation.